Looking to start a church, business, or nonprofit organization in 2021? Do you need help forming an LLC, applying for a copyright or trademark, revising church bylaws, crafting a succession plan, or developing a compensation package for your pastor and staff? Contact the law office of Travel Travis, a Richmond based legal boutique focused on the needs of pastors, entrepreneurs, creatives, and our community. Let's make your vision a reality in 2021. Visit TravelTravis.com. That's T R A V E L L Travis. If you're concerned about the future of your organization when you step down, then where will the mantle fall? A biblical and legal guide to succession planning is a must read for you. It delves into the scriptural and legal aspect of succession planning, characteristics of successors, the people, the process, church bylaws, common myths, even issues with nepotism. Where will the mantle fall? Written by Rich Mazzone attorney, Pastor Travel Travis and available at Amazon.com. Good evening. Welcome to the third episode of Mantle on Mondays. And we're so excited uh, to be here tonight. And I'm going to ask you, as a cause of admission, to please like, share, comment. Uh, let someone know uh, Mantle Mondays is on tonight. Uh, this, this program is, is designed to learn more about pastors, authors, entrepreneurs, conference hosts, leaders, their pathway to leadership, their their, their wins, their losses, their, their tips for success, uh, just to learn more about the mind of, of some of the greatest minds and greatest voices uh, that we have today. And so tonight, I'm so honored to have one of the leading voices in the kingdom, uh, not just in Richmond, not just on the East Coast, but globally, uh, Pastor Jay Patrick. Pastor Jay Patrick is the founding pastor of Liberation Church in Richmond. He is the executive director uh, Liberation Veterans Services here in Richmond, and is the host of the Church Builder Summit. He is the author of three books, uh, Why He Won't Marry You for, for Singles, uh, 21 Things Pastors Want to Say uh, to Their Congregations, and the Millennial uh, Manual. And I'm honored uh, that he is a colleague and a brother here in this city of Richmond. And let us welcome Pastor Jay Patrick as he comes uh, tonight. Welcome, Pastor Jay. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing amazing. Blessings. Thank you for having me. Man, I'm so honored that, that you're on the show with us. I know you're busy. You wear so many different hats. A pastor, an entrepreneur, conference host, a CEO uh, of a nonprofit organization. And it's four days to Christmas. And you have a son. <laughs> That's <probably> Absolutely. <laughs> it's, a son and a wife. <laughs> wants everything into everything and, and, and trying to balance it trying to balance it all but you, you're one of the leading voices greatest minds uh that the kingdom has to offer right now and i'm so honored that you took time out of your schedule to be with us um today so a lot of people don't know your story uh, mm -hmm. people know people see jay patrick today the conference mm -hmm. host the author the pastor mm -hmm. let's go back to the beginning tell us how did you get started? Like, where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So first and foremost, um, I just want to thank you for uh, this opportunity. Uh, you, you are a friend and a brother. Uh, my family loves your family. We, we greatly respect and admire you all um, and uh, just who you are in the kingdom, what you represent and how you all just carry um the uh the mantle of 
of the Holy Spirit in this region. And um, I just follow those that are watching and listening and will watch. Uh, Bishop Travell Travis is the real deal. He is, he's paper Bible saved. He's got the real, the real authentic Holy Ghost. Yeah, yeah, he got, <laughs> he, he got the authentic Holy Ghost and uh, him and his wife, they are for real. Um, so I just want to say that before we get started, man, I love you. I appreciate you. I'm with you because of how I feel about you. So, so, uh, I'm glad to be with you tonight. Um, my story is, is, is pretty, um, pretty simple, man. I'm a country boy. I come from, uh, Pennsylvania County, uh, small, uh, rural County, uh, town called Hurt, Virginia. Uh, actually, the street that I grew up on and the little uh, sub town that I grew up in is called Grit, which is the home of Ricky Van Shelton, uh, <laughs> a famous country and Western singer. Uh, so so um, I grew up there and, um, you know, we have a very interesting background to our family. Uh, my grandmother had 16 children. Wow. And and they were they were uh, some of the first uh, blacks to have their own land in that uh, county. And so the way our um, our area was set up was uh, roughly probably about 10 of my aunts and uncles lived all in the same cluster on that's that right. land. That's right. And um, and my great aunt, uh, Annie Whitler, who founded the church that I grew up in, her husband built the church that we all went to with his bare hands. And so the way it would work is that we'd all live within walking distance of each other. On Sundays, we all descend down to church. And then on Sunday afternoon, we all go up to our grandmother's, my grandmother's house and we have a big uh, Sunday dinner. Wow. Um, so those are kind of my roots. Uh, grew up in a church that never exceeded probably 50 people. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, a authentic uh, apostolic church. I mean, the real apostolic <laughs> church. Uh, glorious church of the apostolic faith incorporated uh -huh. headquarters in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. So uh, the, those were my roots. And, um, and I grew up there and uh, ended up going to college uh, to play basketball and um, did well with that and ended up uh, at Hamden Sydney College okay. um, and uh, was an economics, econ and management major, which then uh, kind of led me down a path. I was going into banking, investment banking and uh, landed my first job in Richmond, Virginia. Okay. Um, I was attracted to Richmond because my sister lives here, lived here at the time. She still lives here. And um, I had did an internship with her and lived and stayed with her one summer. And Richmond just felt right. It just felt right. And um, the rest is kind of history. I've been here ever since. Came here in 2003 uh, to pursue a career in banking. And that's kind of evolved into uh, what we are doing today. So that's kind of how I got here. Okay. So, so through college and work, you end up in Richmond mm -hmm. preaching when you came to Richmond, when, when did you accept the call to preach? So, um, I received the call to preach very clearly when I was roughly 19. I didn't accept the call to preach till I was roughly 26. Okay. Um, and so I'm well out of college. Um, I am, uh, you know, visiting different churches here in Richmond. Um, but I, I stumbled across a very small church that uh, the pastor just saw something in me and uh, decided that uh, or felt that there was a call on my life. And um, I had been feeling that call. And um, it was finally, I had gotten to a point where I was just ready to surrender. So, um, that was kind of how I received the call to preach. Uh, still had no interest in pastoring. It was nowhere in my purview. Um, as far as I had went was that we started a small little Bible study with a plan to just do outreach ministry, 
uh, do some financial literacy, Bible studies. I just wanted to impact the community. I just wanted to be a help to the community. I knew that um, the gospel was a vehicle to do that. I just didn't see all the dots being connected to actually formalize a church. Okay. Um, so we had that, that little uh, small Bible study and, um, you know, and I don't know how much of the story you want. I could give you the whole long, very extremely boring version and I can slice it up a little bit. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. So, so when you talk about, let me, let me rewind a little bit. When you talk about that 19 to 26, mm. would you call that running from the call, ignoring the call, or just putting the call on the back burner? Um, at the time I thought it was running from the call today, I see it as reverencing the call. Gotcha. Um, a lot of people, well, let me just say it this way. I get really nervous around people who actually want to pastor. Absolutely. I get nervous around people who want to be preachers, want to be prophets. Like I don't, I can't relate to that. I, all I saw was the burden of it. I didn't see the microphone, the parking space, mm -hmm. the, you know, you get the first plate at homecoming and anniversary. Right. I wasn't thinking about none of that. All I saw was this was an opportunity for me to actually fail at something mm -hmm. because everything else I had ever pretty much done, I had been somewhat successful at. Right. And so this was the first time I'm looking at a venture, for lack of better expression, that I saw the possibility for me to fail at it because I knew me. I knew my tendencies. I knew the things that I still were tied up in at the time. You understand? I knew that I was not sold out for it. Okay. I love God, right. but my lifestyle was not that of someone who had fully submitted yet. So because of that, I knew that um, I kind of suppressed it as much as I could and for as long as I could because um, I didn't want to disappoint God. I didn't want to play with this thing. I didn't want to be nobody's preacher and live in some kind of way and living half, you know, living half of what I'm preaching about. I didn't want to do that. I wasn't interested in that. And while I will say this to somebody's listening, while there's no perfect time ever right. to surrender, you, you, you don't ever arrive at that place where you have no doubts, no insecurities, mm -hmm. your life is blameless, you're perfect. That that never happens. Right, absolutely. But I did at least know that I was not totally yielded is the word I want to use. Gotcha. I wasn't totally yielded and so I suppressed it as long as I could. So if 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 it wasn't for the pastor here in Richmond that saw that in you, kind of spoke to that in you, gave you that confidence, that platform, do you think you would have continued to run or do you do you kind of credit that moment and that individual to say, okay, now's the time? I would. I, I would have credited to, to, to him. I don't totally subscribe to the fact that it would have never happened without him only because I know God can move in various ways and Absolutely. God can, can get our attention in various methods and various ways. But I will say that it did absolutely take that season to, um, to sober me up and to affirm me to a certain point where I got clear on what I needed to do. And, um, and it did, it took somebody to kind of affirm and confirm what was already kind of wrestling inside of me. Um, I just needed somebody to speak to it. And, and I want to stay here for a minute because I, I dealt with people who are in similar positions. They don't want to be the hypocrite that everyone is talking about. They don't want the pomp and circumstance. They don't want the spotlight. And like you, some of the truly called are the ones who legitimately fear, reverence, awe the calling. Mm, mm. What would you say to that person? I know you already spoke to the how I do you, you you're never perfect or whatever, or it's never the perfect time. But what would you say to that person that's truly legitimately called by God? They see it, 
Others see it. We know it. They know it. You, you I'm, good? I'm you back. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what would you say to that Jonah? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would say to that Jonah? Yes. I, I would say that um, first and foremost, I would say what I've already said again. I would say that, um, you know, you, you don't necessarily need to wait for a perfect time okay. because the timing is never perfect what what you can perfect is your willingness okay and, and so um i don't think god ever is uh waiting on a perfect vessel mm -hmm. because i think again the gifts and call will come without repentance so for God to call you, he had to take into consideration and factor in your issues. Um, all I believe God ever wants from us is a willingness. Okay. And so I think people have to get out of the mindset of perfection and, mm -hmm. well, I gotta, you know, I gotta be this, I gotta be that, I gotta look a certain way, I gotta act a certain way, I gotta talk a certain way. No, what you have to be is willing. I love you, have to, you have to give God a full yes that in that yes is a disclaimer. The disclaimer in my yes is God, I'm coming. I'm flawed, but I'm coming. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? I'm messed up, but I'm coming. I'm I got some stuff with me now. I got a temper. I got an anger issue. I got some stuff in my flesh, but I'm coming. I love and you. so as long as I'm coming, God, I need you to help me every step of the way. Walk with me every step of the way. I'm gonna fall. I'm gonna trip up. I'm gonna mess up. But God, be there with me. Walk with me and assist me um, along the way. And uh, that that's what I would, I would share that person. God, God is not waiting for your perfection. He's just waiting for your willingness. I love that. I love that. Somebody needs to post that up there. Not your perfection, mm -hmm. but your willingness. Mm -hmm. So then you find, okay, I put my toe in the pool. I'm start preaching. Mm -hmm. I'm a little Bible study. I'm mm -hmm. my financial literacy. Mm -hmm. And now God says, uh, I need you to go a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. What was that step to say, I'm now called to pastor? Yeah. Was it a similar process or was it even more intense? It, it was a very similar process. Um, very similar. Uh, I, I did wrestle with that as well. Um, I, I struggled with it. Um, I saw it as uh, an opportunity again to uh, have more responsibility. That's the way I felt. I felt like it was just, it, it felt like a weight around me. It felt like, you know, and, and truth be told, it, that weight is still there. It never lifted. I mean, right. you, you never really um, arrive to a place where you don't feel like you have this bullseye on your back as a pastor. Absolutely. And uh, I I came to it kicking and screaming. I didn't want I didn't want <laughs> I didn't want that on my you know I wanted to be able to be I wanted to love God. I wanted to service people, but I did not want their blood on my hands. My God, I, I didn't want their blood on my hands. I didn't want the responsibility of individuals' eternity right uh, left at my facilitation and my management. I, I didn't want that. And um, and so, yeah, I, I struggle with it, but I will tell you that, um, you know, I, I was, I was literally, I can relate to that portion of scripture where I believe it's Caleb wrestles with the angel. It's either Caleb or Joshua, I believe it's Caleb, wrestles with the angel and he says to him, he says, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. And the angel keeps wrestling, wrestling with right. him, 
his hip out of socket. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Jacob, Jacob. Yeah. Knocks his hip out of socket. And right. um and and that whole wrestling process of of, of God isolating you, mm-hmm. getting you to a place where you are just you and him. And then you having something you need to get from him and he has something he needs to get from you. Okay. And neither of you are willing to leave that mountain the same. So immediately through the wrestling process, uh, Jacob asked the angel, well, 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 who are you? What's your name? And then he in return says, okay, well, what's your name? They said, well, your name will no longer be Jacob, but it's going to be Israel. There you go. Right. And so um, I literally feel like I went through that experience. I feel like I literally went through that wrestling with God, that kind of tug of war with mm-hmm. God. And when God was finished with me, um, I had to I had to ask him again all over again. Who are you? And he had right. to ask me and he told me who I was, <laughs> you know, and uh, and I've been walking with him ever since. First lady asked the question, do you feel that? Are you still kicking and screaming at this point, or do you feel like you've somewhat adjusted to wearing the mantle or grown into the mantle? Yeah. So it's 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 no longer kicking and screaming. Um, what it feels like now is being nailed to an assignment, being nailed to the cross. It almost feels like not to be likened to Jesus, but being likened to an experience that you no longer have the option to abandon. Gotcha. You see, it's 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 one thing to be dragged into something, kicking and screaming. It's one thing to finally arrive and then you cannot leave. You know, it's not an option. So, so everything that I feel today, I have to build space in that in those layers of emotions. Um, because quitting is not an option. Right. Okay. Uh, so I have to give myself some space to be human. I have to give myself some space to uh, to express anger, to express frustration, to express being let down by people, to express feeling unsupported and feeling like you got to do everything yourself and feeling, I mean, all these emotions that come with pastoring and feeling like you want uh, uh, to, to help people through their salvation that, that that aren't ready yet and, right. and all these things. And you have to learn how to give yourself space and room to feel all of the emotions you need to feel without giving yourself an option to surrender. So let me ask you that. That's a, a great question now with so many pastors walking away, mm. marriage is falling apart, mm. drug addiction, suicide. Mm. You're on sabbatical now. Mm. Um, what is your outlet when mm. you say I need space to, you know, get this off my chest or express myself in a positive, constructive, you know, beneficial way? What is your means of doing that? Sure. Well, I'm gonna give you. I'll give you. I'll give you. Um, give you several levels to it. The top level for me is my inner circle. Okay. A lot of pastors do not have an inner circle that's built of people they can trust and be vulnerable with. Most pastors have built their inner circles with colleagues that they're trying to build stuff with also. Mm -hmm. So it's a difference between having people around you where all of you have an agenda. You got an agenda for me, I got an agenda for you. We all trying to, you know, somehow parlay our relationship into some leverage to push us forward. Mm I don't deal with relationships like that. Okay. The way I see relationships is if I actually need you for something and you need me for something, then we're not really friends. Mm-hmm. What, 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 what pastors need is friends. Right. We're not talking about, you know, how many are you running this week, Doc? How mm-hmm. many you got, how many registrations you got, Doc? How many book sales you got? Uh, this, 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 this. You know, we're talking about our families, we're talking about life, we're talking mm-hmm. about this, we're talking about that, you know, we are really pouring into each other. And so I say the 
the number one outlet every pastor should have is two or three people mm -hmm. that they can totally be vulnerable with, totally be, to, to your wife's um, famous catchphrase, to be totally naked with, <laughs> right? To be totally naked with. That's right. You know, um, that you can bear your soul when you're frustrated, when you're angry, when you're empty, when you made a bad decision. Right. Because you're gonna have Sundays. I, I was sharing today how there's a vast difference between being wrong and being wicked. Absolutely. A lot of pastors don't have the luxury of being wrong because they're not surrounded by people who can handle can handle them being wrong without deeming them wicked. Mm -hmm. And so what I what I would suggest every pastor is have people around you that allow you to get it wrong without deeming you to be wicked. You're going to get it wrong sometimes. You're going to make some, you're going to, I got it. I got some things wrong today. Right. <laughs> you know, and I just told my wife, I just told my wife, I said, look, I got to be better in this area. I got to be better. I got to get a handle on this because, you know, I got to be better in this area. And you got to have people that you can pour into. So the number one outlet is you need a couple people. You don't need a whole bunch. That's you right. don't need 10. You don't need 20. You just need a couple people uh -huh. that you can be vulnerable with. That's the number one thing. The number two thing I would say is my outlet is my family. Okay. okay so now, now why, do, why did I distinguish the two? Because some people have their one or two people and one of them is your wife. <laughs> well, well, that don't count. You understand? Know <laughs> Your wife doesn't count in that demographic because here's the thing, and here's another very important fact. Uh -huh. You cannot include or bring your wife into all of your uh, pastoral stress. Right. Because what, because what happens is is that all of the time that's meant for, looks like I lost you again, Pastor Bishop. Um, it looked like all of the, all of the time that is meant, all of the time that's meant for you and your spouse to be enjoying each other, mm -hmm it ends up becoming counseling and mediation for the church. Right. And, and so your wife deserves family time exclusive. We're not talking about church. We're not talking about what Sister Johnson did. We're not talking about what <laughs> Deacon Jones said. Right. You know, we're not talking about. So, so you need a group of people that can handle that stuff and so you don't have to dump all of it on your wife. Absolutely. You know, y'all y'all call yourself having date night and it's really just a church meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, y'all just spend half the dinner talking about, you know, what's going on at church and, you know, and making church decisions over dinner at date night. That is inappropriate. Right. So, so number one, have a group of people that you can, that you can cover that stuff with, be vulnerable with. Then you have... Your your family is your outlet. Okay. I enjoy my wife and my family. See, some people tolerate their family. Uh huh. That's right. You need to enjoy your family. That's right. Get to a place, do the work you need to do, go to therapy, go to counseling, do whatever you got to do. <laughs> Um, spice things up in the bedroom, whatever you need to do, right? right? Take some trips, do whatever, but you need to find yourself getting to a space where you enjoy your family. If you're one of those people that still you drive, you drive home and you sit in the car for 45 minutes because you're not ready to come in the house yet, then that's an issue. That's an issue. Right. That's you need to get to a point where you enjoy your family. You can pour yourself out. I tell you, my the best part of my day is watching my watching Wellington run around the house and play with him and get in the floor and chasing him with his trucks and 
you know, and and all that kind of stuff. That's my favorite part of my day. Um, all of the business meetings, all of the church meetings, right. all of the donations and money we got to raise and this and that and that and this. My best part of my day is getting in the floor of my son and watching him play and enjoying him and those kind of things. So if that, so if you, if you have lost that enjoyment with your spouse and family, how mm -hmm. do you recapture that? Yeah, I think, I think you need to analyze, um, you know, I think you need to analyze what are the, what are the barriers, you know, um, the barriers, uh, typically are, are right in front of you. You just, you just haven't paid attention to them yet. And, and so I think you have to identify what's going on, what's wrong, what, what, where, where's the disconnect. And you may need to, once you find those out, you may need to take off, you may need to engage some counseling. You may need to, um, like I said, uh, um, it's not the greatest time to travel, but, um, you know, a good, nice quality vacation. Right. Um, you know, right. yeah, get out, change, change of scenery, change your environment. Um, a very good three or four hour road trip where y'all can just talk and kind of, um, you know, get, get, get out of the normal rhythm. And routines. Um, you got to break up the routines, get out of the normal flow and do something different. Um, so I would say identify the barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say um, uh, attack those barriers once you realize what they are. Uh, number three, I would say um, change your routines. Mm -hmm. Implement some new routines and new rhythms that give you a change of scenery and an opportunity to switch things up, spice things up a little bit. Right. Um, and then I would say, you know, you know, lastly, um, I would say make the time count that you do have. Um, the challenge you can have sometimes with being married to someone is that the, you can take them for granted. Mm -hmm. um, you learn, and this is important, you learn how to multitask in their presence because you live with them, because you're so used to being around them, you're used to doing something with the kids and talking to them at the same time. Right. You're, right. You're, used, you're, used to, you're used to taking a business call and doing something with her at the same time. You're used to, you know, so you're used to multitasking. Well, what needs to happen, what you need to learn how to do is to give her or him undivided attention, right? You need to learn how to shut down, stop the multitasking, and it's just me and you. It's just right. me and you. Yeah. So let me Don't ask a few things. I love that. I love that. And Serena, if you could just re summarize those uh, five steps. So now, in your case, you mentioned the distinction between your peers and, and, and your friends and then and, and then your family and your wife. Now, in your case, your wife is also your co-pastor. Mm -hmm. So then that I assume there are times when she's your administrator, she's your co-pastor. So how do you make the distinction between I'm talking to co-pastor, I'm, I'm talking to my wife? Yeah. How do you make that distinction? And, and what do you say to a, a pastor who wants to utilize their wife more, but maybe is hesitant or she's hesitant? How did you even go about that process of uh, uh, making Pastor Ashley your co-pastor? And what does that mean to you? How does that function? And how does that, how are you allowed to strike the balance when she does have such a critical role in the ministry? Well, I think the first thing and most important is you have to understand which role or which hat you're wearing at what time. Um, role clarity is so important. I don't recommend personally that um, that you have your spouse as your number one administrator unless you absolutely know how to switch hats. Okay. If you don't know how to switch hats, it is a horrible idea <laughs> to have to have your spouse as your administrator. 
because because you're going to organically blur lines. Right. Okay. And when you blur those lines, it gets frustrating for both of you. And um, and so if you're not good at role clarity, and if you're not good at taking that ha- taking that pastor hat off taking that administrator hat off, taking that, um, you know, taking, taking that, uh, taking the husband hat off, you're going to be incompetent at one of those roles. Um, it's just gonna, it's gonna happen because you're gonna be, you're gonna be giving your, your wife or your spouse grace that you wouldn't give a normal administrator. Right which then causes the execution to suffer because you don't want to hold your wife accountable because you don't want her to be mad at you when you want her to get naked later. (laughs) (laughs) So you don't want to hold her accountable. Right. Then, then it could be the opposite extreme Mm -hmm. that, and this is, I can be transparent. This is what I suffered from with my wife. And she, she was on here. She would tell you all the story. I was way harder on my wife okay. than I was a traditional um, employee or administrator. Right. I was harder on her um, because she was so close to me. Mm-hmm. I held her to a different kind of standard that at times was not fair. And I assume that even also happens with children. Yeah. So, so, so we all, even with children, we either too hard on them, hold them to a higher standard, or mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're too loose and liberal with them and they kind of do it. So let me ask this. Is it that formal and structured to say, hey, here are times, here are our meeting times as employer, employee, here is our time. Is it really in, in 168 hours in a week? Is it really that structured? Yeah, I think I think if you're going to have your spouse as an administrator or working with you, you have to have you have to have structure and you have to carry out that structure the same way you would as 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 if you were um, working with somebody that was hired from an Indeed ad or or whatever, um, because it's, it's not fair, again, for you all to be having church meetings at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> you know, so that's, your pillow talk. You talking about that's, that? You know that's that's not that's not appropriate. Right. That's 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 time for you all to. Um, God bless you, uh, Natalie Bunton. God bless you. Um, it, it is um, that's inappropriate. That's that's time for you all to pour into each other. Right. And so that's why if if you have normal business hours from from nine to four. Right. Or, you know, whatever. That's when you need to. That's when y'all need to meet, and that's when y'all need to to uh, to conduct your business. Otherwise, you're gonna have a um, you're gonna have some disconnects. <laughs> she passed that. She said she fired herself a couple of times. So now, she did. <laughs> now, when you started pastoring, you you were single. How would you say having a wife and a son has made you a better person, a better pastor? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so let me um, let me back up just a taste because I didn't. Get, I, I I gave you two things in terms of how I um how I um handled the stress of all of this, right? Okay. So, so I got my my close inner circle. Okay. I got my family, right? And then I have my hobbies, right? Okay. You know, whatever your hobbies are. Um, you know, you should have some healthy hobbies. Uh, we happen to live on a golf course. I'm hoping to, to, to take up golf, learn how to play that a little bit. Love watching movies, um, uh, things like that that help me to relax, help me to kind of unwind. Um, I have a few shows that I watch kind of religiously. I do a lot of reading. Um, you know, I do some reading. I watch a lot of podcasts. And I love content. I love information. I love developing and growing myself. So if I'm so an ideal, perfect time for me is what I just experienced last week. Um, we were able to go down to spend some time at a beach house. 
I had a couple of days to myself just to kind of pray, read, you know, reflect, watch the water, sit on the deck and just be peaceful, eat some good food and not have to deal with nothing to deal with the church. Don't call me about the church. Don't talk to me about the church. Don't ask me about the church. Nothing about the church. OK, then my wife and Wellington came down a couple of days later and then we got to just spend time together and all of that. Watch TV, eat good food. You know, that's that's I'm in I'm in my I'm in heaven in that kind of environment. You know, so she gave you your time and then you had family time. Absolutely. 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 On, on two ends. So. She gave me time. The first two days was to myself and the last day was to myself. Okay. You know, so, so we build that into and, and vice versa. If she needs that, I have no issue with it. I have no issue with her taking a couple of days and pampering herself and, and, you know, getting her pedicures and manicures and right. spa days and whatever she wanted to do. I don't care. Go ahead. Help yourself. Enjoy yourself, you know, um, <laughs> you know, but, how is my family, how is my family and um, my wife and my son, how has it helped me to yes. be a pastor? Well, um, pastor and person. And a person. So I'm kind of answering the same question the same way. I mean, they are my sponge, meaning um, I go out into the world and if you just imagine going out and getting drenched with, you know, life mm -hmm. decisions, you know, I'm, I'm, most people don't know this, Bishop. I actually literally run four separate organizations and I'm at the right. top of all of them. OK, so I am from the time I leave this house, I am making decisions, holding meetings. Uh, um, you know, dealing with this, dealing with that, switching hats nonstop all day. Um, and then everything that I, everything that's been poured onto me. Right. When I get home, my wife and my son are my sponges. They literally, figuratively, metaphorically, they take everything that's been poured on me and they just like, like sponges. Wow. You know, absorbing it off of me. And by the time, by the time I lay down on my pillow to go to sleep at night, I'm pretty much almost back to normal. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I wanted to ask you that. And uh, you're the executive director of Liberation Services. Mm -hmm. So with everything you're dealing with as you're a full time pastor, full time husband, full time father. And then you're also running a business. You're a thinker, as you mentioned, a strategist. You are an entrepreneur in, 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 in the secular world, entrepreneur in, in the spiritual. How do you have enough brain capacity for vision, strategy in both worlds? I know for myself, I felt like there's, I play ping pong or tennis sometimes. I, my, my, you know, my head is over here. Then my head is over here. You have a good Sunday, and you over you 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 feasting and basking in the glory of God. And then there's Monday where you got to shift, and you're back back and forth, and you wonder sometimes if, if if I didn't have the secular, you know, I could really excel in the spiritual, you know, or vice versa. You're excelling at both. How are you capable of the brain capacity? to run to, they're somewhat related, but totally separate entities. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, the simple answer is infrastructure. The second layer to that would be the team that you have, right? So there's a lot of intelligent people. There are a lot of thinkers. Um, I always like to use this example in my in my training sessions. I always ask, I say, how many of you all think that Michael Jordan is the best basketball player ever? 
And then I asked the group, I said, well, how many of y'all think LeBron James is the best basketball player ever? Mm -hmm. And then I got about six, you know, 60% of the room raised their hand for Jordan, 40% raised their hand for LeBron, depending on the era that, uh, what age group I'm dealing with, right? Right. Um, But when they finish, I always tell them, I say, now, uh, I appreciate all of your responses, but the truth is, is that neither of them are the best basketball player in the world. Mm-hmm. The best basketball player in the world is more than likely a guy you never heard of on a playground in New York somewhere right. that you never heard of him and you will never hear of him because although he was extremely gifted, he did mm-hmm. not have the infrastructure or the team around him that would support him going to levels greater and greater and greater. Right. So for me, I am very, very humble and self-aware that it does not matter how intelligent I am. It does not matter how many great ideas I have. It does not matter uh, how much of a critical thinker I am. If I do not have an infrastructure around me that supports me being able to be a visionary, because you cannot be a visionary and be a manager at the same time. Right, right. And most people don't understand that. Most people try to be a visionary and want to be a manager. I loathe management. I can't stand it because if I have to manage something, that means I probably got somebody in place that's not doing their job. Okay. If, if, if I'm truly going to be a true visionary, then that means I have to staff managers. I have to be able to select managers that will be able to manage different pieces of the organization that allow me, and this is important, to be good at what I'm good at. Okay. Okay. I, I don't I don't need to be dealing with things that I'm not good at. I, I, I tell this example too, probably maybe five, six years ago, I was um I was uh, I had hired a graphic designer to do a flyer for um, for an event we were having. Mm-hmm. And the graphic designer came back to me and said, okay, well, what, what color scheme do you want? And so I told them the color scheme. They came back, okay, well, you know, what kind of feel do you want? I said, uh-huh. okay, and I told them. And they came back and said, well, you know, um, what kind of font do you want to use? And then I gave them the font and then they came back and they says, oh, yeah, well, you know, what kind of size does the flight? And I said, wait a minute. Fine, right. I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is what you're supposed to be. That's right. Good at. Right. I hired you because I am not a graphic designer. Right. If I was a graphic designer, then I would not have needed to hire you. So. I have learned to put people around me mm-hmm. that allow me to be good at what I'm good at. Okay. Okay. The more I, time I have to spend designing flyers, right. the less time I have to be good at what I'm good at. If I have to go into the sanctuary and understand that the volume is too loud in the monitors, Mm -hmm. then guess what? Now I got to take some of my virtue that's designed for preaching and casting vision. Now I got to take that and I got to give some of it to my sound engineer. Right. Right. Now, if I come in the sanctuary and I realize that it's hot in here, Mm-hmm. and somebody need to turn the AC up, well, guess what? Now I got to take some of my virtue that right. was meant for preaching, and right. now I gave some of it to the sound engineer, right. I gave some of it to the graphic designer, and now I got to give some of it to my facilities person. <laughs> because somebody didn't right. have the forethought to come in and turn the AC up because it's a hot day in the right. middle of July. Right. Right? right? And so then... If I go in, into the lobby and I see that it's only one person greeting and it's supposed to be two, mm-hmm. now, you see what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's all these things. So you got to make sure that you have people in place 
This is the key thing. You got to have people in place that allow you to critically think, uh -huh. that allow you to be a visionary, that allow you to be good at what you're good at. And so that is some of my secret sauce, if I have any, is that I select people mm -hmm. and then I empower them. Okay. This is your lane. I need you to be good at this. Now, I'm going to give you expectations. I'm going right. to set the expectation. I'm going to set the bar. I'm going to tell you how it's supposed to go. But after that, I don't want to have to repeat myself a whole bunch of times. I want to just, I want to, I want to be around people that get it. Okay, I see the vision. I understand how my pastor thinks. I understand my pastor's mannerism. I understand his flow. Let's go. Let's move. Let's get it done. Um, um I was yeah. going to say, I, I, I highly recommend it's going across the bottom. Pastor Jay is the, the founder and the host of also the Church Builder Summit. And a lot mm -hmm. of this information he's given, he has given before. I encourage you to read his uh, books, Millennial uh, Manual. Um, mm -hmm. You also have Church Leadership Moments, 21 Things All Pastors Want to Say to Their Congregations. And I fondly remember uh, Pastor Jay was posting on Facebook these, these different uh, things. And, and and I'm grateful that he uh, uh, memorialized them all in the book. And, and I encourage you, if you haven't gotten them already, get them for your teams, uh, whether it's your church, whether it's your nonprofit organization, whether it's your business, you know, get this information out. Pastor, I want to rewind it, and our time is almost up. You are a founding pastor. And, you know, we didn't start out with a salary. We didn't start out with, I'm sending you 25 people to get you started. I'm pay your rent for the first two or three years. And so when someone here in your church now, our churches are the same age. You started in April of 2009. We started in June 2009. And I've seen how God has blessed you and graced you and, and, and grown the ministry. Mm -hmm. So when they hear teams and infrastructure, at what point in your ministry were you able to shift to a team uh, infrastructure model. So many churches 20 years later are still the one man band. Mm. You've shifted to being the conductor of a, of a symphony. How mm. do you, when you start with nothing, mm. people, it's not even like you got a family, you know, you didn't, you, you didn't have a wife and kids. So, you know, I started my wife and my daughter was three months old. How do you mm. develop that trust, that culture? Mm. How do you even make that pivot? Because I think, when you look at some of the churches that really do grow and those who don't, it's because they're never able to make that pivot. How were you able to make that pivot and win? Yeah, yeah, great question, Bishop. First of all, I need to qualify the question by helping everybody understand that uh, for about three and a half years, my church was less than 25 people. I need to clarify that. So. Um, our very first service, we had very first service, we had 178 people show up to our very first service. Mm -hmm. Our second service, there was a total of seven people there, and four of them, <laughs> four of them was on the praise team. You know what I'm <laughs> four of them was on the praise team. So um and and it stayed. About seven people one Sunday, ten people one Sunday on a perfect, perfect spring day in 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 May, where the one of those Sundays where everybody comes to church at the same time, we might have had twenty people, and you couldn't mm -hmm. tell us nothing. Mm -hmm. So now, how do you shift gears? How do you pivot? How do you shift the narrative? First thing you got to understand is how you do anything is how you do everything. Okay. Uh, another way to say it is, is how you do some things is how you do everything. Bishop Younger said it this way, and it hit me like a ton of bricks a long time ago. He says, even in humble beginnings, excellence is still required. That's right. And so... Um, I can always tell when a church is going to stay stuck 
and when a church is going to break through by the way they conduct themselves and the way they approach ministry in the storefront, in the small building, when it's 10 of them, when it's 15 of them, you can always tell because it's a mindset. That's right. It's a mindset. It's how they function. It's how they conduct themselves, how they think about things. It's a certain level of organization. And so first is, is that you have to make sure that you shift your mindset okay. from storefront mm -hmm. or shift your mindset from a small church, mm -hmm. right? You have to change the way you think about ministry before anything will change. Um, you know, um, if you still think about it as, you know, for example, for example, you know, there are churches who I've been to churches where, um, you know, it's a small church and you might see a kid, you might see a three or four year old, you know, on the stage, you know, tugging at their mama's coattail, mm -hmm. you know, or or playing with their toys on the stage while their mama's singing or something mm -hmm. like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because I. <laughs> we had that conversation at our church. <laughs> but 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 it's 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 these it's, it's these little things, Bishop. It's, it's these little things. Listen, I was I was only good at teaching. I didn't have I I'm I'm not a I, I played the drums, but I'm not what you would consider a musician. I don't have the ear for singing, so I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't lead worship. I couldn't do nothing. I could teach, mm -hmm. right? And so here's what I felt figured out is, okay, if this is going to be excellent, I got to control what I got to control. And I got to, I got to highlight what I'm good at uh -huh. and I got to get everything else out the way. So, um, so I realized very quickly that a lot of the stuff that we were trying to do that we weren't good at, we had to stop doing. And we had to highlight the things that we we're good at. Because when you just start doing stuff because everybody else does it, you, you start right. engaging in a lot of things that you're not really good at. And so, you know, so again, so and then when that happens, you have a lot of unprofessional things that happen. You, you start starting late. Like I said, you have, you know, you got little babies running around mm -hmm. on stage. You know, you got your, your flyers and stuff or uh, misspelled words and mm -hmm. all kind of stuff. You know, your, your, your paint chip, your, your ceiling tiles are dirty. You know, all these little things that don't cost a lot of money That's right. can be fixed when you change the mindset. That's right. That's right. And so and so for me, it changed, first of all is I had to shift my mindset and start thinking about excellence mm -hmm. and realizing that excellence is not about a number of people. It doesn't mean that we got a packed house. Right. It just means that the way we conduct ourselves is built toward our strengths. Okay. And anybody that chooses to visit or chooses to come through those doors are going to get our best. They're going to be exposed to our very best. And, um, and that's what we did. And, um, and I started, the second thing I did was I stopped looking at the empty seats mm -hmm. and I start looking at the souls. That's good. That's I think good. as long as you look at empty seats, you're going to be, you're going to be held hostage by those empty seats. The minute you, the minute I start looking at the souls, okay, my perspective shifted. I like that because instead of saying, "Okay, we got fifty chairs in here and only seven people are here," that's forty-three empty seats. Mm -hmm. Now, change that language to, "I got seven souls in front of me that I'm responsible that I'm responsible for their uh, for their eternity." I love that. If I don't pass to them well, their blood is on my hands. Mm -hmm. Now, now you got seven people in front of you 
that your your perspective and that one little change, mm -hmm. your 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 church looks completely different now. Okay. Right. And so when you take a look at it that way, what happens is, and what happened for me was that now instead of focusing so much on the people that aren't coming, mm -hmm. I'm pouring into the souls that are there. I love that. And when I did that, I realized they start multiplying after their own kind. The stronger they got, they went and got more people. I love that. Yeah. I love that because we're we're so numbers driven. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we look at the numbers and, and, and especially now with social media and with television, you know, you were talking about earlier, how many how many you running doc? Mm -hmm. But I think as a shepherd, it's important to look at the souls and not just members. And I, and I think that that is so important. What do you see as the future of liberation? And even yourself, do you see yourself pastoring liberation forever? Do you see multiple liberations? What, what, what do you see as the future uh, of yourself and liberation? Well, um, that's a good question. And um, obviously I've given it some thought. Um, you know, I wish we were having this conversation in June of 2021 because it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's some things that, you know, uh, that I'm praying about. But the reality is, is that um, I, I believe that liberation is a model, right? Um, it's a model of what. I believe is on the heart and mind of God. Um, I will say I do not have a passion or a desire to just have church. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that there is an intensifying need for the church to become more and more mobilized. Um, meeting people's needs where they are, opposed to erecting this temple and screaming from the hilltops, "Come see us! We got the best! We got the best temple in the neighborhood! Right. We got the best singing! We got the best children's man! We got the best this! We got the best that!" I think that model is becoming less and less relevant because people in crisis don't care how good your children's ministry is. Okay. They don't care how good your brazen worship team is. Mm -hmm. What they want to know is, do you hear my cry? Mm -hmm. What they want to know is, do you see my child doesn't have any food? That's do right. you do you recognize do you recognize the pain in this city or are you just interested in having church? Right. And so I think that while there is a need for the church to congregate, meet, train, develop, and deploy, mm -hmm. I think a greater concentration of our energy over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years is going to have to be not just not just talking about the church, but embodying and exemplifying it. Many people now are turned off by what we call church. Right. They are calling it on the carpet. They're pulling it on the carpet and they're saying, wait a minute, this is false advertising. Uh -huh. This is not what this is supposed to be, right? And, and so while, yes, I go all around the world and talk about how you need to be excellent and how you need to do this and you need to do that and you need to do that. But if you do not create a foundation of your ministry to really see and hear the people in your city That's right. and what they're going through, and take it upon yourself to expose them to Jesus Christ tangibly, mm -hmm. then I think 
this model of showing up on Sunday and who can perform the best tricks. Right, right. So do you think the pandemic has accelerated that or proven the necessity of it? Something that was what we were overlooking and now it's, you have no choice but to recalibrate and rethink your ministry. Let me tell you something. I don't care if you're, if you're, if you're Stephen Furtick, T.D. Jakes, or Bishop Travell Travis, in the middle of this pandemic, you all got the same thing. Mm -hmm. A camera <laughs> and what it is that you have to say to the world. That's right. Okay. And, you know, you, you, while yes, we can be creative and we can come up with all this and that stuff, but Yes, the, the pandemic exposed that this generation cannot be maintained in godliness mm -hmm. through our productions on Sunday morning. Right, right. If, okay, me and you and 20 other pastors we might as well stop the competition for who can put on the best show. Right, right. Because I can put on a show this Sunday. I can bring, you know, I can bring, uh, you know, um, I can bring Travis Green mm -hmm. to my church and I'll pack it out. Right. Well, you can bring Kurt Franklin next Sunday. Right. And everybody that was at my church, they come into yours. Right, right, right. <laughs> you understand? So at some point, we got to get back to the basics. Okay. And we got to really get back to meeting the needs of the hurting people in our communities, the widows, the imprisoned, the hungry, the naked, the homeless, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the and part we, of the acts that we overlook. Yeah, yeah. In the book of Acts, we talk about the baptisms and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. But when you look at it, they talked about the widows and the homeless and the bound and, and the neglected. So you're absolutely right. If we want to go back to being a true apostolic church, it's more than just the preaching and the baptisms and the whole infilling of the Holy Ghost. They, mm -hmm. they, it was a community that looked out for each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 one thing that God shared with me maybe two years ago, a year ago, is that kindness is a universal language. It's the language we can all understand. It doesn't matter if you, it doesn't matter if you, uh, what walk of life you are in or what stage of life you're in, what economic class you're in, what demographic you're in, what race you're in, what ethnicity, whatever. If you slow down and offer kindness to your community, Mm -hmm. Everyone can understand that. And once they understand that, then they got to ask, well, who is this kindness in the name of? Mm -hmm. What name is this kindness being offered? You know why they have to ask that question? Because kindness is not common. Right. It's, it's, it's not common anymore. It's not, you know, we're in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're right. in the last days. Right. We're in right. perilous, perilous times. Men are lovers of themselves, Everybody for themselves more than lovers of God. Right. So when we come out of ourselves and we focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ and we, we distill that into a message of love and kindness, mm -hmm. then guess what? When you show that kindness, a person has to ponder, mm -hmm. this, is, this is different. Right. I'm not used to this. You mean to tell me that you're going to do this for me and you don't want anything in return? Absolutely. You mean to tell me that I don't owe you anything? Exactly. You mean to tell me you're not going to invite me to your church? Right. You mean to tell me that there's no strings attached? Right. Why are you doing this? I'm doing this in the name of Jesus. I'm doing this as an extension of who Jesus was in the earth. I follow his teachings and through his teachings, I have uncovered that it is my duty and my responsibility to be a giver because it's better to give than to receive. I'm representing the kingdom, not my church. And that's I'm representing the kingdom. We're, we're so worried about building kingdom. our churches rather than building the kingdom of God. 
I love yeah. it. Can you just quickly say your 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 motto for your church for those who have never heard it? You you've said it, but can yeah. you just say it one time for everybody to hear? It is yes, it's to love people, to show kindness, and to serve change. How can people get in touch with you, Pastor Jay? They can't. I'm on sabbatical. No, I'm, just <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. They can follow you. Just say that way. Follow you. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, they can follow me on social media. Um, I'm only on Facebook. Um, I, I I I have a limit on my social media capacity. Uh, and so I'm not doing the clubhouse. I'm not doing none of that other stuff. Uh, Facebook is my limit. So you can follow me on here. Uh, it's J A Y Patrick. Um, that's it. You can follow me on here. And the nuggets he's dropping as God gives him nuggets to drop, he goes live. And if you're following him on uh, Facebook, when he goes live, you get the notification to watch him as he shares live or, uh, even if you watch the replay, I'm always blessed by what God gives him. He speaks the heart and the mind of God. He also speaks on behalf of pastors. And sometimes when a pastor uh, doesn't know how to express themselves, you know, to his congregation, mm -hmm. God uses Pastor Jay to really step in it and, mm -hmm. and really express some things and sometimes takes the blows, you know, but I appreciate him going in the ring and, and representing pastors and articulating the heart and the mind of pastors. A lot of times, you know, people don't understand us. Um, right. and so I appreciate, you know, you're really uh, helping people to understand the, 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 the process of being a pastor and what it takes. Um, yeah. I'm going to end with this. Um, and I appreciate you being on. And, and I hope that everyone has enjoyed you. And if you want to sew into Pastor Jay's ministry, uh, I'll put his cash app up. Maybe he says something to you. We believe in the sewing into good ground. And clearly you have good ground, uh, a man that after God's own heart, uh, who's not in it for the income, but the outcome has accepted the call of God and is doing uh, great things for the people of God. So my, my closing question, I asked this last week different, how do you want to be remembered? But I want to ask this to you a little bit different. If Pastor J. Patrick, 30 years from now, is invited to speak at your church, how would you introduce him? Hmm. Pastor Jay Patrick is invited to my church. The Pastor Jay Patrick of 30 years in the future is invited. Okay. How would you introduce him? <sighs> wow. Wow, that's interesting. You put some thought into that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave you, I had to throw one in there. Just to, to yeah, so so here's, here's a fun fact about me. And Bishop, you actually you really don't need to be in a hurry. I, I set this time aside for you and, and, and everything. So just know that you know you got me as long as any other questions, or if you want to open it up to your to your viewers for questions, okay. I'll do that. I would do that for you. Okay. Um, um, but here's a fun fact about me. Um I hate introductions. <laughs> so you know, when when churches ask me to send my bio, uh -huh. I send it out of compliance. Right. But what I really want to tell them is you don't need a bio for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm very good with just keeping it simple. Mm -hmm. You know, Pastor Jay from Liberation Church, um, he loves God. And it is our prayer that uh, that that you enjoy with what the Lord lays on his heart. <laughs> That's it. That that's all I need. All of the other stuff. It makes me uncomfortable. It makes me feel weird. Um, it makes me feel. Uh, it just makes me feel weird. So I, you know, so if I was introducing that Pastor Jay, and if I knew him like I know him, I would say this. I would say, um, everyone, uh, I know this man of God to be one that is humble. And one that is uh, not for long introductions. So, <laughs> without further ado, <laughs> here's Pastor Jay Patrick. <laughs> Let the Lord use him real good. That's what I say. <laughs> I like that. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. that. <laughs> Pastor Jay, he, he opened up the space for questions. If anybody wants to post a question in the comment or if you just have anything, 
Uh, you want to say that's how my wife introduces me. They they put her on the spot. She's up there now, and they said we're gonna get the first lady to come introduce him. And she said, uh, "Receive Travel Trap." That's right. <laughs> they drop the mic, go back to the seat. <laughs> I mean, like, you, know, <laughs> you know, love of one wife. You know, <laughs> you know what what else you want? You know, right, right, right. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. I love it. If there's no other questions i don't know we give space for them to to, to come in um but uh church builder summit put a plug in for that i know we just finished one and you got one coming up in october um uh, tell us tell us about it why the pastors <clears throat> owe it to themselves and to their teams to come to church builders yeah so um church builder summit is another um uh, um uh, Jacob moment for me. Um, you know, I, I was not, there's so many conferences, there's so many conferences, so many summits, there's so many, you know, now master classes. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And I never wanted to be just another uh, thing for people to have to choose whether they want to go to. But I felt um, a very strong conviction from God to host something different. Now, you say, okay, Pastor Jay, well, what's different about your conference? There's conference tailored to smaller churches. There are conferences tailored to mid-sized churches. There are conferences tailored to, to larger churches. Well, here's what God told me to do differently. Um, most conferences are about what I would consider to be bricks. Mm -hmm. um, when you consider building something, you look at the bricks, right? Bricks are preaching, praise and worship, youth ministry, mm -hmm. hospitality, all these things are your bricks. Right. That's what most conferences you go to are gonna deal with the bricks. Mm -hmm. God told me to build a conference that focuses on the mortar. Gotcha. So it is the intangibles mm -hmm. that Church Builder Summit is really focused on. You can build your bricks up as tall as you want, but you can knock them over very easily if you don't have any mortar. Right. So what I'm focused on in Church Builders is things that are intangible, mm -hmm. like culture, right? like team building, mm -hmm. like chemistry, like... Um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, operational soundness, right. uh, fiscal soundness. I brought you in to do right. legal work, right? Right. right? You know, the legal side. You know, there's not a lot of conferences that are dealing with the mortar, for lack of better expression. So if you're just looking for bricks, if you're looking for, you know, what's the best marketing strategy, you got $100,000, you can put some lights and LED walls and all of that. The church builders might not be for you. But if you are looking to come to a conference that's, that that actually will allow you to take your church from here to here right. without changing your budget, right? church builders is it. I, sure. Most of the things that we teach don't have a budget line item. Absolutely. It is really mindset and it is about culture is what we're teaching. And we've taken our church and our and our echo. We took the sessions from this year, and we took about a month or two of Bible studies and just applied them to us. Mm. And whatever was said, now mm. let's 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 do an analysis of our church. Let's this wow. thing, and wow. it's been a tremendous transparent blessing. Culture, traditions, doctrines, how wow. we operate. It really mm. allowed, but it. It, it was great because it wasn't just me saying it. You right. Know, they, they heard the videos. They, they've seen the success stories and things. And wow. said, okay, now, what does this mean for us? And yeah. what can we do now, you know, uh, under the pandemic, with our numbers, with our budget, what, what can we do? There was wow. a question about the pandemic. Um, and it's interesting with churches not being able to function like normal. It seemed like there is an increase in the number of churches uh, that have gotten started. I know I've been contacted from a legal standpoint. How do I start my church? And I'm like, you starting a church now? You know, my my, my thinking. Uh, but I understand God does what he does. And in some of the most unusual circumstances, that's when God 
does unusual things. So what would you, how would you advise a pastor that's called to start a church right now when most churches aren't even allowed to even gather? Yeah. So I would, I would advise them in the same spirit that I approach church builders. And it's, it's the intangible things that most pastors don't have a good handle on. So I'm going to sit down with that pastor and I'm going to ask them a very, few very practical questions. The first question, be it, believe it or not, that most pastors have not settled is why are you starting a church? Mm -hmm. Have you concretized your why? Now, many may find that to be a very simple question that they say, well, because, you know, we need to grow the kingdom. We need to da 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 Right. Well, that's, you're not, you're not listening because you haven't heard the question right yet. Why are you starting your church is really saying, what problem are you intending to solve? Absolutely. Because there are clearly enough churches Absolutely. in your city. Mm -hmm. The reason for you starting a new church must be founded on the principle that there's a problem existing Absolutely. that is not being solved by the current number of churches that are in your city. Otherwise, you just need to collaborate with the church that already exists. You need to just you need to just join forces with the church that already exists. And most pastors, believe it or not, Bishop, cannot answer that question. What problem do you intend to solve? Love what it. where are you directing the energy of all these volunteers and all these people that you are saying you want to come and join your church? Do you want them to just come to Lake and hear you preach? That is a flawed model. If that's your answer. It's Absolutely. flawed. You, 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 you know, you, you, you're not going to get very far with that. You have to have something in mind more than just, I want an audience. Absolutely. I want an audience. You got to have something. You got to have a prop in order to start a church to, 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 to do that. You need to have a problem that you want to solve. Um, I, I would, I would urge you, I would urge you to, not just plant, but I would urge you to take at least six months of research and development. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, you can just turn on Facebook Live and start your church. Okay, <laughs> right. I would take at least. I would advise anybody to start this planning to start a church. Take at least six months of research and development. Research. Research your demographic. Who do you intend to reach? What right. problem do you intend to solve? Okay. What is your core message? Right. What is your core message? Right. And how do you intend to get that message out? What is your ideal um, population? Right. Right. Are you called to Gen X, Gen Z, Gen Y? Are you called to all of them somehow? And if you're called to all of them somehow, then how do you intend to make them all feel valued and not make it feel like a millennial church? Right. But you got, you know, 30 percent baby boomers. Right. Or you got, you know, uh, you making it feel like a baby boomer church and you got 30 percent millennials. How do you blend it? How do you merge it together? So I just think that a lot of people see pastoring and starting a church as something that's so easy to do mm -hmm. that they approach it so casually. Right. And I would just say that there's a lot of pre-work that most people in this position have not done. Right. And because of it, um, the churches really don't go very far. They don't so you, get they, they got a call, they find a building, you get a sound system, get a flyer, a Facebook page. I'm ready, ready to roll, but haven't really thought through why, why has God commissioned me to start another church in this city? And I appreciate that because our church, I asked them the exact same question was well, like two weeks ago. And mm -hmm. I was reading this book and I recommend if somebody's here, start with why mm -hmm. uh, it's from a business perspective, but you can apply it to so many areas. And mm -hmm. that was the question like, well, why, why do you need another one of us if we're doing what everybody else is doing? There has to be something 
that God is calling us to do that's not being done or needs more of being yeah. done in the community. Otherwise, you're just, like you said, another entertainment venue. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we yeah. don't want to be that. Uh, we want yeah. to actually make a positive impact um, on our community. I don't know if there's any other questions, but Pastor Jay, I appreciate you, man of God. I appreciate yes, you, you, your, your willingness and how God has blessed you and continues to elevate you and promote you and praying God's blessings on your ministry and your life. Um, is there any closing words you just want, inspiration you want to leave with uh, a pastor or first lady? This is your space as God leads you to 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 minister uh to pray or to close out and as how God speaks to you sure so first of all I would just say to everybody that's listening everybody that's watching thank you all for tuning in thank you for your support thank you for um just just being on tonight um I would urge you uh based on the last question um if you are thinking about starting a church if you have a church if you um, you know, are looking to be a successor of a church, whatever you are looking to do, um, you need sound consultation. And so um, I'm here to also recommend Bishop Travell Travis, his legal services, his um, uh, uh, services to, for nonprofits and uh, and, and all of that. You need to sit down with someone um, and give all of uh, your flesh some skeleton. Um, you know, in many instances, uh, again, these ideas, these church planning ideas, these conference ideas, all this stuff, we have all these ideas and it's just flesh. Mm -hmm. But you need a skeletal body to go right. in the flesh. Right. And so it's individuals like Bishop Travis that can help you with that. Um, it's individuals like myself that can help you with that. Um, you know, if you have a need for that type of thing, um, again, I usually will do, I'm not doing a lot of traveling now, but uh, I will meet with your team on a Saturday or something like that via um, in a digital space. Um, because sometimes you again, you cannot think of everything, you cannot right. think of everything, you cannot execute everything, and you do not have all of the tools in most cases. Um, and so a lot of you that are listening, you are um, a little bit behind in your administrative layout. And you need to go back and get some legal advice. Mm -hmm. You need to go back and get some operational advice. Right. Um, and uh, and then prayerfully, your 2021 or 2022 uh, can have a lot more wins as you plan them. Mm -hmm. uh, you will win the in the areas that you plan to win in. Right. If you are not planning, if you're not strategizing, um, you're going to probably repeat the same cycles. Uh, until you run out of gas. So um, I want to see you win. I want to see you succeed. The body of Christ needs healthy churches. That's right. The body of Christ needs healthy ministries. Mm -hmm. um, we are in a, a, a state where the nation is more divided than ever. Mm -hmm. uh, poverty is going wild, running rampant. Sickness is running rampant. Man, as much as we are in a pandemic, we are in an opportune moment for right. the gospel right. to rise to the surface mm -hmm. and for this uh, nation and this world to be redeemed by the love of Jesus Christ. It's getting dark outside, but I believe the light is on the way. And in order for that to happen, we must be great facilitators Absolutely. because every church that runs into scandal Mm -hmm. Every church that runs into gossip, every church that doesn't do right with the money, That's that right. hurts people, that betrays people, that lets people that every time that happens, it is putting us further and further behind because there's no way to separate us. Mm -hmm. We're all one church. Right. And when one of us falls, we all fall. So we got to get to the point where we're all winning. That's right. When all of us win, we all win. So. That's what I'd say. I love y'all. God bless y'all. Come on, Thank put you. the emojis. 
Let's thank Jay Patrick, Pastor Jay Patrick. Show him some love in the comments. Let's post him on the screen. Thank you, man of God. Blessings to you, you and your family. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Thank you. Share those comments. Tell them thank you. Tell them how much you appreciate them. Show them some love. Uh, next week, uh, we're honored to, 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 we're taking this as the Lord leads us. Uh, next week, we're honored to have as our special guest, none other than Bishop Mark A. Moore, Sr., Faith Covenant Church in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, author of Provisions for the Journey, and the host of the You Can Get There From Here Visionary and Leaders Conference. We're starting off in January with Bishop Eugene McCray, the founder and pastor of the Praise Temple, Way of the Cross Church in Anchorage, Alaska, and hear his journey growing up in uh, King Street, South Carolina to DC and packing up his family in a, in a vehicle, in a van and driving, literally driving from Washington, DC to Anchorage, Alaska uh, to, to birth a, a, a church. And so you want to hear his uh, story of faith um, you want to hear Bishop Moore. We have some great speakers that we're lining up for January. So we want to hear from you. If this is blessing you, uh, we want to hear from you. We, we, we just took a prompting by the Lord to, to start Mantle Mondays. I said, I do it one month at a time, but um, uh, we're, we're led to go into January. And so if there's some guests, perhaps you recommend some topics you would like for us to cover, uh, please like, please share, please comment, please tag, inbox somebody. Uh, let us know if this is uh, benefiting you uh, to just to be able to learn the minds and the stories and the testimonies and some of the best practices of some of the great entrepreneurs, pastors, authors, and leaders uh, that the kingdom um, has to offer. And we close with this and we wish everyone a, a Merry Christmas. Uh, and we close with our, our, our slogan, remember it's never too early to plan for success. So once again, Merry Christmas. God bless you. Be blessed uh, in Jesus' name. Looking to start a church, business, or nonprofit organization in 2021? Do you need help forming an LLC, applying for a copyright or trademark, revising church bylaws, crafting a secession plan, or developing a compensation package for your pastor and staff? Contact the law office of Travel Travis, a Richmond based legal boutique focused on the needs of pastors, entrepreneurs, creatives, and our community. Let's make your vision a reality in 2021. Visit TravelTravis.com. That's T R A V E L L Travis. If you're concerned about the future of your organization when you step down, then where will the mantle fall? A biblical and legal guide to succession planning is a must read for you. It delves into the scriptural and legal aspect of succession planning, characteristics of successors, the people, the process, church bylaws, common myths, even issues with nepotism. Where will the mantle fall? Written by Rich Mazzone attorney, Pastor Travel Travis, and available at Amazon.com.